to this session on house building, greener, cleaner houses built with passion and love. Um, I'm Kerry Shivers. I'm from um, Central Queensland University. Um, I'm actually from South Australia, um, but I'll be convening or hosting this session. And we're going to stick to the um, to the order in the in the guide. Um, and we're going to have about 20, 20 to 25 minutes per presentation, and then deal with the questions at the end as a panel if everyone's happy with that. Um, so we'll get started with Ben Law, who's presenting on our re-emerging woodland culture. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, there's something going on in the woodlands of the UK at the moment, which is quite a powerful movement. And it's, it comes from predominantly sustainable woodland management. But through it, it is starting to create a whole pattern of buildings. And it's that re-emergence of a, a culture of our woodlands that I want to put across to you. Because it's a, it's a powerful way of enabling people to take control of building and also manage habitats and woodlands as well. So I'm starting off with a bit of coppice woodland. Um, for those who are not familiar with what I mean by coppice, coppice is broadleaf woodland that we harvest during the winter months. And we cut it down to the ground, but the trees don't die. They send up new shoots every year, and then we harvest the new shoots to create buildings and crafts. And this tradition has been going on in this country for over a thousand years. And it almost came to a point where it started to die out around about the 1950s. And since then, it's been slowly, slowly ticking over, re-emerging. And so it reaches a point now where it's really beginning to grow again. And there's a, there's a real culture of people involved with it. So part of this process, when we cut down these trees, involves creating amazing habitats. Because the pattern of light coming into the woodland the coppice regrowing, being recut, allows things like bluebells and early purple flowering orchid to flourish. One bit of woodland I'm working, if this is the pearl border fritillary butterfly. This butterfly is almost extinct in the county, I mean, but by re-engaging, recutting that coppice, getting that ancient way of working the woodland starting again, the habitat for this is beginning to be recreated and its chances of survival are a lot more because the food plants it needs are dependent on the human element of actually going in and cutting the coppice woodland. So when we cut the, cut the woodland, we get poles of different ages, different lengths, different thicknesses, and from there we create a whole range of, of different things. And this is sweet chestnut, which is the main coppice woodland I work with. And the amazing thing about sweet chestnut is not just the fact that it produces fantastic nuts to eat, but it is an incredibly durable timber. If you look at that picture, you can see there's a, a creamy ring around the outside, and that's the sapwood. And the rest of it in the middle is the heartwood, and the heartwood is the, the part of it that is totally durable, full of tannic acid. That is a naturally durable pole that will last a very long time. So that's the bit I'm building with. And by keeping the wood in the round, we don't have to take much out of the wood to get a connection of heartwood to heartwood. So my work with constructing the roundwood began when I built my house 13, 14 years ago this year. Um, and what interests me about it is, if you look at the house as it is today, 14 years on, that, the house is doing fine. But what's much more interesting than the house is these are the very trees I cut the house from. So 14 years on, they've already regrow regrown this much. In another 14 years, I'll be able to cut them down again and build another house. So I'll be getting two houses out of the same tree. 
And while I'm building that house, it will be growing again. And then another 14 years further down the line, I'll cut it again, and there'll be free houses. <laughs> and meanwhile, it will keep growing again. And again, we'll end up with four houses. So I think you get the pattern. Basically, what I'm doing is, is being able to create multiple <coughs> houses out of the same trees, because they will continue to throw up a yield of coppice from which we can cut the timber and build the houses. So when you're looking at trying to find sustainable materials to build with, it's very hard to see anything much stronger than this as a renewable resource where you're helping wildlife and at the same time getting a continuous supply of materials from the same tree. Over the last sort of um, 10 years, I've been experimenting with the best types of joints to build these houses with. And for a little while, probably made it a bit complicated. And I've now simplified it down to, there's two joints you need to know to build a house. So if you learn the two joints, you can build the round with. One is the mortise and tenon joint, which I'm showing there. And the other is a scribe joint, which we refer to as the butter pack joint. Now, scribing techniques are common in Scandinavia, Canada, North America, for building log buildings. And log buildings are logs stacked up one on top of the other. But what we're doing is quite different. We're actually lifting up frames out of the logs. So we're using a lot less timber than a log building. But we have a lot more stresses on our joints because they're supporting a lot more weight. So we've had to come up with kind of a hybrid between traditional green oak building, as you get in this country, and um, the log building, which you'll get in um, the States and Canada. And this is what we call the butter pat joint. Um, the butter pat name comes because it looks like a lump of butter in a butter dish. Nothing more complicated than that. Um, there's two sides to the joint. And when it's closed together, <coughs> you can't see that internal part of the butter pat. What you see is this nicely sort of cut together <coughs> two bits of wood very nicely scribed to one another. But within there is a right angle cog that transfers all the weight of the building back down to the padstone foundation at the base. And we've worked with engineers to check the joints, check the loadings on them, and we're really happy with the results we've got. This is a typical roundwood frame under construction. <coughs> a lot of round poles, but within that, there are only two joints, the butter pack and the mortise and tenon. There's also a lot of other products we make from the bits of wood other than just the, the poles for round we're building. These are chestnut shakes. Split out of the, um, the timber, we can use smaller lengths. Um, <coughs> by cleaving the timber, cleaving means prising the fibres apart rather than sawing it, we get a timber that lasts a lot longer. It's basically when you saw into a piece of wood, if you put it on the roof as a shingle, it will absorb a certain amount of moisture because as the water runs off, you've opened up all the grain. It's almost like, a bit like a bit of blotting paper, really. When it's cleft, the water runs off. So a cleft, sh cleft shape will last a lot longer than a sawn shingle. Sorry about the, the language. It's a bit confusing, but maybe if I say, a cleft roofing tile will last a lot longer than a sawn roofing tile. This is a little building we did for the National Trust, and, um, and that's got <laughs> about 14,000 cleft chestnut yeah. shakes on the roof. Where is that then? That's in Hazelmere in Surrey. Oh, okay. yeah. Just taking on a, a project this year for the Wilder Downland Museum in West Sussex, and that's going to have. 56,900 hang clefts <laughs> chestnut shakes on the roof. But all of this means that we're managing more coppice. We're, we're able to keep cutting more of the, the coppices around the area, which gets them back onto cycles. So many of them have been neglected. As we start to cut them again, the light comes in, the wildflowers return, the butterflies return, and the next time we cut them, we get, a, we get better quality poles to build and construct mm -hmm. them. 
Here's another one we built. Um, this one's in Partridge Green in West Sussex. Um, this one was on a farm and um, we used um, <coughs> some of their oaks to do the cladding. Everything else was out of a local woodland. And you get a feel for the, the inside. You can see the round wood and, um, Yeah, it's quite a pleasant house, really. I utilise um, models a lot when I'm working. I find, um, for me, I can look at two-dimensional drawings and I can get an idea from them. I can look at three-dimensional drawings and I get totally lost. So I, I need to build a model if I'm going to build something. And I tend to build my models to scale, then I can scale all the timbers from them. And that's the method I work. This is um, a little roundhouse we built at a primary school. And um, the nice thing about this was we actually engaged the children in the design process. Mm -hmm. So we asked the children what they wanted. Some of the ideas were a little challenging to manage. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, couldn't get the swimming pool on the roof. <laughs> um, the, a lot of the ideas we managed to incorporate. There was this desire for an underground space, a kind of secretive, sort of dark place underneath the building. And this, this we managed to create. So. This was the building from the front, so it's an open classroom. Um, it's got things like wobbly bridges and connecting to it. And it's also used as a community theatre space. <coughs> and down below it, we've got this area where we, we created this underground part, which um, is all quite low, the, low the ceiling height on it, and um, utilised a, a large number of um, round timbers, which created the roof but also supports the floor above. So it's a bit like being with a big giant cartwheel above your head. And then the higher floor, we went for a reciprocal oh. roof. So, which um, gives a, l a lovely light coming down into the centre of the building. Sorry, yeah. How do you manage to support it with the, with the timber on the, on the ground? On the ground, our foundations basically are all padstone foundations. We dig out um, usually a maximum of a cubic metre of soil we compact with either stone or rubble, um, and then we put a, a piece of natural stone, usually about 100 mil thick, on top, and the posts just sit on top of that. Yeah. So the, the buildings are, are sitting, they're not attached to the ground, they're sitting using their weight just to support themselves. Yeah. Is there any form of mechanical connection between the ends of the poles there, or are they sit, they're sitting? They, there is a connection. They are they are sort of scalloped out, so they sit into one another. But there is um, basically a, a like a coach screw going through to secure them on that. Yeah. <laughs> Built simple micro homes as well. This is um, a little roundwood caravan, which um, is very popular for people setting up on the land or in the woods. Certainly useful in in this country because they tend to comply more with planning laws than a, a lot of other buildings might. This is, um, in my village, this is Logs with Lada, which is a um, community shop. Um, all of the timber came out of the woodland in the village, um, and um, it's a non-for-profit shop, so profits go back into the community. Um, last year we were able to provide um, sort of zip wires and swings in the in the playground through the profits of the shop. So everyone knows in the village that if they buy from this particular shop, they're improving the, the environment they're living in. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. I remember when you constructed this mm -hmm. and having seen it often, did you use describing methods for this structure as opposed to the old details? Um, this, is, this is scribed, yes. This is scribed. The other thing is, is that on your very, very Green roofs too, yeah, yeah. Still standing, by the way. <laughs> um, we also use a number of softwoods. Um, we use European larch, um, western red cedar, Douglas fir, and um, Lawson cypress. Um, basically, these uh, these are 
are timbers that are naturally durable to some degree and um, are available in a lot of the, the plantations around where we are. Now we're taking out a lot of them to try and encourage a bit more broadly for generation. But in doing so, you end up with some quite strange shaped timbers, such as this one here. And normally to foresters, those are basically seen as waste timber. You can't do anything with them. What we're doing is we're felling those timbers, measuring the curve, and then designing the building around the curve. <laughs> so it, it's kind of a, a very different approach to how an architect would start. An architect might start with a client and talk to them about what building they want. They then come up maybe with a very beautiful building, but then it's after that they tend to look at where it's all coming from. What I'm suggesting here is we go the other way around. We go and see what's available locally. We actually measure the shapes of the timbers and then design the house from that. Um, so it's a, it's a different approach to the, the order we do things. And um, that particular pole made the ridge in this little retreat. Thank you. Um, another couple of curves, and um, this one's um, just an open building over natural swimming pool, see them roof. <laughs> Just when I put this one up, um, one of the things going on in the UK at the moment is there is a real growth in carving spoons and whittling. And it's fantastic because it's often people's first ever moment where they make that connection of a piece of wood and making something from it. So, um, I think there's a, there's a whole generation that's starting with spoons, they look at bowls, furniture, houses. It's all part of this the re-emergence of our culture of what people are making. So the other things that come out of the coppice woodland that tie into the buildings are the woven panels, whether they're for inside the building or for fencing. The chairs that we need to, to sit on, made from the, the timber in the woods and from the bark of the bark. Here's a lamp a friend of mine made from sweet chestnut coppice. All of these woods can produce so many of the things we need in day-to-day -day life, and what you're left with at the end becomes your firewood to heat the house. Obviously, to, to get this whole re-emergence, this whole sort of cultural thing moving, we need more and more people getting involved. So the importance of apprenticeships and getting more people into the woods has never been stronger, and yet the demand is incredibly high. I've had about 40 applicants this year for two places to come and um, train in the woods. Also do some training in the building so the, the techniques can be passed on as well. And through the <coughs> timber framing courses I'm running, they're now becoming a wonderfully international way of building with Brownwood. Um, a lot of people coming over from Australia, America, across Europe, and they're taking these techniques, learning the joints, then taking them back to their own countries, applying the species of timber they have, and starting to create beautiful buildings just from these couple of joints that come from the forest. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
child with a spoon, <laughs> through to making a chair, through to building a house, making a yurt. So there's step oh, by wow, step cool. projects for people to get involved with. So. Fantastic. Can I get an autograph copy? Yeah. Um, sadly, not today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was about the only one left. That's fantastic. <laughs> Thank, thanks great. again, Ben. Thank you. Thank you. Great, so um, next up we've got Tedro Bonner um, with his talk from Permaculture to Passive House, Cutting Edge Construction to Save Our Planet. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a question for you, how many people here know about Passive House? See if I get a hand. Quite, quite a bit, okay, all right. Um, then I'm gonna try to not talk so much about the science and hopefully get more into how the United States just shifted the Passive House paradigm, okay? Um, so we'll see where we can get and sort of get into the philosophy of that a little bit. Um, okay, uh, just tell you a little bit about our company. Um, I'm actually a sociologist by training, and I work uh, really with this paradigm. My colleague here, Marsha Amadon, works with me, where we're really focusing on sociology, ecology, and technology. Pro passive House is pretty much on the technological side, and we're very interested in this triad of function, being, and will. Okay, so this is my compass. And uh, I've been working in Ukraine for the last year with the whole mess with energy in Russia. I have gotten very, very, very <coughs> convinced that my goal is to live as lightly on this planet as possible. And after our talks this morning, I think we are really understanding that our world is in a very, very dire place. So this is what's interesting. So this is the <coughs> IEA's 450 prediction is, is that if we make the standard easy enough, that there's a 50% chance that people comply. This is the curve for emissions that need to happen, and that is almost impossible. By the way, this is done by BP, so we understand that all these energy companies are looking at this. When we look at basically our biological footprints, Germany, which we consider to be some of the brightest in the room for passive house, their, their footprint still is, is, is really not so great. I mean, it's, it's, you know, and when we look at our biological capacity, what we're taking from the planet, biomass, food, is obviously skyrocketing in itself. Now the one encouraging thing you probably all know, since you do know Passive House, is that we're starting to see this great thing where our energy is slowly decoupling from the economy. And that's very important, that's, that's the silver lining. That we can have an economy not dependent on energy. And that's what Passive House tries to get to. Okay, so here's our typical American family, okay? Uh, just so we understand, Americans consume six times more energy than anyone else in the world on average. This is what we use for energy per person. If we take a family of four, here we are, and look at the size of the PV array we need. Yeah, solar's a beautiful thing, right? We love solar, but here's what we end up having. Basically, one family needs about the four, equivalent of four tennis courts to meet their needs. And the install cost is over a million dollars, which you can't see so well. Doesn't sound too doable to me, but I love solar. I think it's a great, great thing. Perhaps the bigger problem is, is when we look at global demographics. And the real thing that's happening is, is we're moving the cities. You know? So if we look at the United States, it is hollowing out from the center to the edges. This whole area is a city now. It's sort of one by its giant city. And we're seeing it all around the world. Marsha's actually giving a talk on future cities tomorrow, is it? Mm -hmm. And she'll get more into the demographics about this and how we might be able to get children involved. But the main point is, is how do we create a, a, a sustainable solution inside of these urban environments? That's one place where Passive House is extraordinarily promising. So let's think about this. What do we need to live regeneratively? I think Probably people in here brighter than me could come up with even more categories than this, but it's everything from food production, our interiors not being toxic, exterior, democratized shared energy. We usually don't think about that. But really, we have to share our energy if we're ever gonna come up with a sustainable solution. And culture, and obviously we want our buildings to be lasting for a century or two, right? For people here with no passive house, we know that we are interested in a very holistic energy analysis. So we could build passive house buildings out in the countryside, but really what is our travel footprint? 
interesting thing about cities is, is that cities actually are much more sustainable typically than rural areas until we get to consumption, and then it switches. And by energy, how much energy is in the material, the, the construction of the material, the transportation material, these become big issues with passive house, right? Energy renewably sourced, can you distribute the energy, the global warming potential of the energy, um, externalities, all these categories have to be considered because what we're doing is we're generating a full, holistic approach to looking at how we consume energy, that's passive house. So when we look at these hobbit people, well, okay, it's really cute, but how far are they traveling to their house, right? You know, it could be, what I like about Ben's project is it could be your projects are actually carbon negative, which is very, very promising, right? Because, and that's why passive house is moving back to wood 18 stories high, right? Because of the fact if we properly source the wood as Ben is doing, then we actually can come up with a carbon negative solution. We're storing carbon inside the buildings. Very interesting. But we have to look at all these categories when we consider about energy. Okay. So today, I'm not gonna get through this, but the key thing is, is, is that when we look at these projects, these are all passive house projects, very different. Uh, we're looking at schoolhouses, commercial buildings. What I love about passive house, you will do is that it is a great method for affordable housing. This is a homeless shelter in Pittsburgh. This is uh, affordable housing for seniors in New York. New construction, renovation of an existing uh, gym. So the promise we're seeing in America is, is that because the energy costs are driven so low, it's proving to be by HUD, which is one of our big agencies for affordable housing, to be one of the great determinants for getting people out of poverty. So when we look at this as a social movement, Passive House seems to be a very, 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 very important way to do it. Okay, so let's get a little bit into science. As you all know, ideally what we want is for the heating of the buildings, right, and the heating from people and lights and equipment to equal the loss from the building, and then obviously from ventilation. Great stuff. And there are areas where they can do that. That's our Shangri-La condition. You don't need a heating and cooling system, right? Okay. But typically, we end up in this situation. So in a, in a cooling dominated environment, the south of America, the building still overheats, okay? And the real demon here is latent heat. It's the water heat. And so we have real problems in the south of America. We can't actually get the passive house to work too well in our cell. Uh, but the key point here is, is that even if you have a system, we're still, we're still overheating the buildings. And then there's the reverse. Heating dominated environments, well, okay, so even with appropriate insulation and everything, we still are losing too much heat, okay? And so we run into this funny situation. So here's where I live, which actually was a passive solar constructed building. And it was good mass in glass, a lot of glass, which is heating up a huge piece of concrete. Okay? And so, yeah, sure enough, it heats up all day long on a clear day. Okay? And it looks like this is great, except for the fact when we look at this. And what we see is massive amounts of heat loss. I mean, so what always struck me with these pictures, I like stood outside. This is the back of the building, there's no glass here. So we expect to lose heat through glass, that's not surprising. But this is the back of the building, well insulated. And it is just glowing red. It is just losing massive, massive amounts of heat. And so really, this approach of passive solar, it, it, the, one of the great problems is it had these huge swings in temperature. It, it, just, it just could not overcome that, at least in our part of the world. In the Shangri-La environments, like the Midwest of America, certain parts of other parts of the world, yeah, it works great. But this whole paradigm came about in the North. So as you all know, the Germans came up with a very bright idea. How do we heat our buildings through providing fresh air? It's a very interesting thing. 
Passive House, at least from my perspective, it didn't come about so much from just figuring out how we provide energy to heat our buildings, rather it was fresh air, right? So that's very, very, very important. So as you all know, we have these modern contraptions, HRVs, ERVs, and what they do is they basically preheat the cold air coming in so when the air comes into the building, it's already slightly warm, and then it does the reverse in cool environments. But the fact is, is, is that in certain environments, you actually could, once again, create a very, 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 very low energy building. And a lot of it was around creating fresh air. One of the great, great, great things the Germans did. <coughs> okay. But as you also know, to do passive house, you need an extraordinary airtight building, which sort of traditional build the con building construction people sort of aren't so fond of. They say your air building needs to breathe. Well, passive house says no. In fact, the interesting thing is one inch square, obviously it's bigger here, that one inch square in a winter condition, because of the humidity inside the building, it will put 28 liters of water inside the interior of a wall from the vapor drive, the water trying to push outside. So when we're looking at air tightness, we're not just trying to consider air, but we're also trying to consider the issue of water. And the main thing is, is this that airtight buildings save about 10% energy a year. A lot of energy by making your building airtight. Continuous insulation. I don't know if these projects are being done this way in England, in the United States, you're finding massive amounts of insulation for the, underneath the footing, right? I mean, so the nice thing is they're starting to get away from using all the foam, and they're actually starting to use sheep wool, rock wool you folks are probably familiar with. But nevertheless, in a lot of parts of America, you have to be able to insulate the entire building, every single little crack, every single little crevice, everything needs to be sealed, okay? and the insulation is from the outside, okay? Now, where passive strategies can work is some places in the Midwest in America where the foundation acts as a giant cooling block, and so they're finding there are conditions where passive strategies work absolutely fantastically. No, no doubt about it. But up here, you, you need to insulate underneath. And then the latest window, well, we're basically a quad pane now out of Germany. That's a Zola window. And I don't know, I think uh, we go by R values, but they're around R15. I mean, it's phenomenal. So basically, they're as good as our walls were in America, where we used to build to. So that's pretty amazing for a window. OK. So. What this all does is, is when you take all the metrics that need to be done for becoming passive house, passive house ends, in, ends up using phenomenally less energy than any other metric. The interesting thing here is, is that the Rocky Mountain Institute considers it the third best, but that's only because of the fact passive house did not incorporate solar into their projects. But I mean, way, way, way little energy. And one of the problems they're facing now is, is that the issue is not about energy, the issue is about appliances. So this is the amazing thing. Heating is not the big energy issue any longer. It's the fact that we use so many electronics, uh, our stoves, our ranges, all, all these different things. But the fact is, at the end of the day, our Hello Kitty hair dryer, I hate Hello Kitty. <laughs> would end up basically, at peak heating, heat three passive house flats in London, average size, 60 square meter, which is pretty amazing that on the coldest day, and this is not for London, by the way, but this is, this is for the US, but the fact is, is that that hair dryer uses more energy than what's needed to heat three flats on the coldest day of the year. And the amount of energy used for the entire year one quart of American lumber for the entire year would heat all these flats. That's a little bit of energy. And that's what makes Passive House absolutely amazing, is you just don't need 
that much energy. And once we figure out the plug modes, and once we can get all the consumer electronics under control, we might have a chance, as we heard this morning. Okay. So, <coughs> passive house is a great standard, except there was one problem. It wasn't working in America. And the problem with America is, is that we are climatologically the most diverse nation in the country, and we couldn't get the standard that works in a perfect climate band of Germany to work that well in the United States. We tried, we tried, we tried. And yeah, sure, there's places in America where you can get it to work, but in a lot of places it couldn't. And then, and then all these other questions popped up. It's like, well, okay, so what happens when I'm putting so much insulation, insulation into the building? What is the carbon footprint of that insulation? I mean, it's coming from somewhere, right? I mean, you gotta get to, you got to get the insulation from somewhere. So how much global warming potential is in the insulation? The other question that came up that really was the big one is, is that shouldn't we allow renewables into our project because solar is becoming so cheap? There was a cultural issue, okay. And then the other issue is, is that really now it's about, it's about appliances. So they changed the standard in America this year and they did a very smart thing. They went really back to permaculture roots. And they said, as Ben was saying earlier, it's our location we have to consider first. Where are we? And you know, it's funny, a friend of mine works in New York, they're finding 11 degree temperature differences just inside New York. I mean, huge swings in temperature. So what the American standard just went to is saying, it depends on your location, and then you design your metric from there. Okay. I got just a few minutes, I'll try to run through this quickly. This is our site that we chose to do a project. Reason I love it, right off the bat, my driving uh, one way down so I can save a lot of CO2 and a lot of energy, okay? It has great microclimate potential. I don't know if it's not moving. It's trying. <laughs> Hope it'll go. So, you know, as permaculturists, what you see here also, also is you see watershed potential, there's tons of water. It is, it is completely, it is completely forested. So the interesting thing about here is that it's only a heating environment. It's not a cooling environment. So here we are, right, okay? And that's great because I don't have to worry about cooling systems. I only have to worry about heating. And this is just taking too long, so I might need to end it. We'll see what happens. So, you know, again, this is the permaculture principles applied. Let's use our woodlands to cool our buildings. Four trees can meet 60% of your cooling needs. Why do we need to have mechanicals? Permaculture, from my viewpoint, is very interested in this, right? Uh, and, uh, yeah, we can Yeah. Do you have uh, any charts comparing life cycle analysis, which would be much more interesting than just pure energy use? So with the because like we we call these materials high space information and so on, it's kind of uh, that that's that's true. Okay, so the life cycle analysis, cradle to cradle, is what all passive house tries to get to. Okay. In America, we got to this point where we were building 30-year buildings, and that's absolutely useless, right? The, 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 these projects are designed for a century to two centuries, okay? And one of the things that makes doing life cycle analysis hard, or at least I haven't done it yet, is because I'm working on retrofits, okay? Because 90%, 98% of our work is retrofitting buildings. Only 2% of buildings is new construction. How do we do retrofits for passive house? Um, yeah, it's good taking too long. So, um, but it's it's a it's a great question, right? I mean, we with retrofits, I think quite often the problem is the money side. It's quite pricey usually. 
That's right. And so our rule of thumb is, is, is that the investment has to be covered by your energy savings. So you have a choice. You either can pay for carbon, right, or you can pay for adding value to your process. And believe it or not, we've gotten to the point, especially in America, because energy is very, very expensive, where the cost of doing the retrofitting or the new construction actually is less expensive than, than keeping a standard building. Okay, I think I'm very quick okay. the time, yeah. You want to finish Well, that? because it's not working, I don't think, yeah. Okay. I could try to get to, yeah. Like, it's sort of working now. <laughs> no, 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 we can go uh, zoom out and try and zip to the slide you want to get to. Uh, maybe I'll get to the last one, because I think I'm almost out of time, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, if I get to the very last slide, We'll show the graph. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, actually, this one up here. Uh, up here, I'm sorry. Should we go up from there? And up from there, I'm sorry. That one there. So, okay, so passive house, as you all know, the modeling is the important piece because really that saves a lot of energy. If you can predict what your building is gonna do before you build it, you've saved a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of money. So the project we're <coughs> working on, it's been modeled, and this is a retrofit, this is existing building, is we brought the annual energy down from 44,000 kBTU down to 2.7. That's a huge savings in energy. We were able to reduce the amount of solar panels from uh, 7.5 kilowatt down to four. Okay, so, you know. And the one sticking point we're still having is the primary, or is the peak heat load. But the, the thing you see here is, is that this is how we get to living lightly on this planet. Then when you combine the driving, lifestyle changes, appliances, all of a sudden we get to very, very low energy solution. Perfect for urban environments. So, so I'll leave it there. Fantastic. Thanks, Tedra. That was fantastic to talk about the importance of um, passive house and Building to suit um, locations, I think that's really important to suit local environments. Um, hopefully you all noticed uh, in the changes to the, um, to the program, uh, Richard McCowan's talk on rethinking nature, a biomimetic perspective, um, is now replaced by Eileen Sutherland, our next speaker, um, who's going to be talking about learning to build with passion. Great, hello everyone. It's nice to be here. Um, albeit, you know, second best. Richard <laughs> couldn't come, Richard couldn't come, so I stepped in. Not that I'm anything to do with Richard, so I'm a completely different company, so I wouldn't want you to think that. Um, anyhow, we, um, we're a company called Straw Works, and my topic today is training the natural building of the future, and learning to build with passion. We're going to call Strawworks for natural builders, designers, consultants, and trainers. And Strawworks is run by the well-known Barbara Jones. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is her book here, The Real Building. I am the lesser well-known Eileen Sutherland. Um, <laughs> and uh, my role in the company is the business side. So if you, later on when we're having questions about technical stuff, you ask Ben, and you ask Tedro, <laughs> you don't ask me. I'm just generic. <laughs> okay. Um, I do have previous. I have built a straw bale house in Bulgaria. Um, and I was hoping to show you a little video, but I don't think we've got time. But nevertheless. Um, we realise that uh, there's, a, there's just a bit, I've been touched on it actually, that there's a small pool of natural builders in the UK at the minute. And uh, we find when we go and have our, we do our builds, build projects, we, it's very difficult to get a team together because there just aren't enough people. 
So I thought, well, we'll try and do something about that. Um, and so last year, almost a year ago now, we established the School of Natural Building, SNAB for short, <laughs> to increase the pool of national builders. Now, what is natu natural building? It's working with what nature provides, exactly what Ben's been talking about, um, to create healthy places to live and work and play, and by using the materials as close to their natural state as possible. For example, the curved, the curved piece of wood in this case. In our case, it's mostly straw. Natural buildings breathe. Now, Ted, we've touched on this about buildings breathing, and I think this was in a different context. Our buildings breathe through their walls because they're natural plasters and we're covering a natural product, which is straw. Builders, the buildings that aren't natural uh, can be toxic and can be very um, hazardous to health, really, as well as get sick building sy syndrome. But natural building isn't just working with these materials. It involves intuition and skill and knowledge, experience, and a bit of passion. It's not enough just to know the skill. Um, the natural materials are usually plant-based with low embodied energy. Again, Ted Rose talked a lot about um, embodied energy. Um, so for example, straw bales is our favorite, uh, but we use some timber, hemp, wood fiber board, recycled paper, and cotton, sheep's wool, clay plaster, lime plaster, <coughs> and biodegrade stone and sand. Um, and we do use a couple of semi-processed materials such as smart ply, lime render, recycled bone glass, and firefox. But none of these are cement, and um, they don't have any glue, sealants, or anything formed from petroleum. So who can become a natural builder? Anybody. Um, SNAB particularly encourages women. Um, when Barbara started out in the construction industry 30 years ago, there was 1% of women in the, uh, in the industry. Um, and there's not that many more now. So we estimate, but in the natural niche, the natural building niche, there are over 40% of the workers are women. And of our SNAB trainees, we have 35 now, 62% um, are women. And the youngest is 25, and the oldest is 63. So uh, age is not a barrier either. What if you want to come to, the, to do some natural building, you want to learn how to do it, and you've already got some experience? Well, we can cope with that. The way that we work is that we have a, a accreditation of prior learning, so we take that into account. You just need to tell us about it, because every trainee has their own learning contract, their own bespoke learning contract. So we've got a list of modules, some you don't need to do, some you do need to do, and so your learning contract will be quite different from somebody else's. How long does it take? Most people take about a year because they tend to have other commitments. They don't tend to do it full time, and they dip in and dip out of the modules as, they, as their time allows. Um, so flexibility of the training allows this, and there's no real start and end date completely up to you. The SNAB curriculum covers practical on-site training and theoretical classroom-based work and practice and experience. So the first, the practical on-site training, the availability of that would tend to be in the <coughs> summer, in the summer when we have builds, so between March and October, it tend to be the build season. And we would teach these sorts of skills low impact foundations, we do a lot of car tire foundations, uh, straw bale building, building clay and lime plastering. So that would tend to be between March and October. In the winter months, we do more theoretical training. We're just about to start that now. Um, and we have four one-day modules. Preparing to build with bales, designing with the bale in mind, designing details, and essential plastering. And these are all introductory. Uh, modules to uh, so you learn the theory behind, but it's also um, great preparation. These are also very useful for self builders. People who want to build self. What do you mean with the bale in mind? Sorry. What do you mean with the bale in mind? With the bale in mind, I haven't got anything to draw on, but you can visualize a bale, yeah. which is about 900 by 450 by 350. Mm -hmm. So it's that shape, yeah, it's rectangular shape, and so you want to accommodate that shape when you're designing. 
So you don't want to have something like, I've just been to see a, a, a build up in the northeast where the architect designed a corner that was not 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. It was like this. It wasn't round. It was a, a bigger angle. I'm no mathematician, so I can't tell you what it was. But um, it involved the bales coming in the way that I've explained to you, because that's the way it come off the bale. <coughs> put two strings around them, keep together. Everybody on that build had to unstring the bales, string them the other way, put them in a box with a slant on it. On top of the slant, it had to have a chainsaw, and they had to chainsaw off a corner of the bale. That architect didn't design with the bale in mind. Do you see what I mean? If you design with this shape, then you're going to get a much easier airtight build. If you don't design with that shape, you're going to get some odd corners you're going to have to try and fill. Yeah, fill them up. Um, we also offer a bit of CPD um, for people who want it. Um, Self-employment. A lot of natural builders could be self-employed, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we're raising the competition, but um, I'm no spring chicken and nor is Bob. So, you know, we're not going to be here forever. You want the next lot coming through. Um, we do self-employment. We do a little couple of days on presentation skills and training methods because we work a lot with self-builders. And so when you're working with self-builders, you have to be able to impart the knowledge. You can't actually just do it for them. And we do an overview of project management on contract builds and self-build courses. How do you organise these builds? Quite tricky sometimes. We also offer, off, offer extra practical courses in carpentry. These are just when we have the time and when they come up. And also dry, dry store walling, walling and coppice craft when we can. Accreditation. <coughs> There's no framework at the minute in the UK for um, if you want to be an actual builder. <coughs> so we're working with CERTA and we hope, fingers crossed, nine months time we'll have everything in place and uh, we will have the first accreditation for straw bill building. Uh, and we hope for our current trainees we'll be able to offer that retrospectively. Again, fingers crossed. Some of the projects our students have worked on this year. This is in Leicestershire, the two-story two story load-bearing house, so there's no timber frame. This is just the ring beam, ring beam, joists on there, the ring beam. These are just, um, uh, I can't remember what you call them, because it's a technical word, corner bracing, they're corner bracing. So they would come away. Two-story house built under, it's interesting, under a, a metal, curved roof of a Dutch barn which was already there. So quite, quite interesting really. We did the straw bale and the clay plastering is being done now. Single story, again load bearing. I'm guessing people know the difference between the two, load bearing and timber framed uh, straw bale building. Timber framed is where you've got a frame of timber and you put your, your uh, bales in like Lego. <laughs> and um, the load bearing is where you've got a, a ring beam like a ladder on its side, you've got a hole in the ladder, you've got a sharp stick, and you put the bale on. And you build up four stories, sharp stick, down four stories, and so on and so forth. So you've got an internal structure as opposed to a timber frame. Um, this visitor centre. We've just started this with, oh, sorry about that, upside down. <laughs> it's interesting, we often build upside down. <laughs> it's not, it's not <laughs> hard to do it the other, the right way. Um, that will be the, in the accreditation as well. Um, this, we've just done the, uh, the car tires so far, but this one we're going to do, somebody talked about life cycle analysis on this one. This will be our first one to do this. So very exciting. Um, this is in, uh, in London, in Ealing. Uh, very nice, a project uh, for a community build. And it's now up to its roof, it's great. Um, we go to Eco Build in London. As you can see, some of our trainees enjoy that sort of thing. Um, this is a private extension in Lincolnshire. Again, the car tires have just been done. 
20 foot having been to go on. Um, this is down to earth in Swansea. This, this building has a reciprocal roof like Ben was showing you, the one across the round. And that's an infill. Now this is a timber frame one, so this is infill. This is not the load bearing one. Uh, a passive house, a passive house settled in uh, Norfolk with straw bale walls. So that might be a way of considering the insulation. We had some tests done on that. I don't want you to ask me about them, but they were very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, this is um, a load-bearing passive house. Very nice, beautiful, beautiful roof. So very nice to look at. Um, and this is tremendous. This is a terrace. This is our first terrace. And uh, it has disabled access and room for a lift and all sorts of things. It's uh, beautifully done. And in Harringay, um, there's the Eco Hill, which is a community building. This, this is an area um, some years ago that had terrible riots. And uh, out of it has sprung this, sprung this great community movement. And they've raised money for this building. And there's a cafe and rooms where you can train. Um, it's very, very nice. And around the side, there's like a little go kart path and cycle track, a lake. It's very nice. Oh, this was my video, but it's not with it. Um, and so, if you want more information about SNAP, go to Strollworks <coughs> or contact <coughs> Ben. I have actually taken the liberty of putting some of these um, leaflets over on that shelf over there. So please feel free if you want to take them on. Um, and uh, I have a few of Barbara's books, should anybody want them. Um, I think I'll leave it there because the, the little video was just just self aggrandisement really. I was just gonna show you just gonna show you um, our straw bale build in Bulgaria, which is the one I did with my family in two thousand and eight. Um, it cost fifteen thousand pounds, very, very lovely. And you can see it at hotnitzer.com. Oh, if it's anybody H O T N I T. Is it definitely not gonna work? Because you've got Sorry? Is it definitely not going to work? Um, I don't know. Where's, is Alan with us? No. The technical guy? It doesn't yeah, work I've in this no presentation. Skill, but, I can try. <laughs> but it's on the stick. I don't know if we can oh, find okay. it. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to ask um, when I say Do you want me to have a fiddle you? while we <laughs> start? Yeah, I can have a fiddle. Okay. No worries. All right. Well, thanks so much for that, Alan. Okay. <laughs> Would you prefer we stand? I'll stand because so we could see see us. Um. All right. Well, I, had, I saw that hand first. So, so if, where? How do you make it if you have this uh, this uh, wooden frame building that you have to fill up with the straw belts? And you have this. You now you have uh, construction like this, and then you have to support the support like this. So how do you manage to fit all this straw in? What do you mean if there's a if there's a gable end? If it's, it's yeah. like this. That would be infill. That little bit would be infill because you'd already have the timber frame from the the a, a bit of the roof trusses, so you'd already have that bit there. So you fit the straw bales in there. You just make them fit the same size. You'd cut them. There's a you can get a big thing called a baling needle. It's like a sewing needle, but it's huge, and you use that to to half the bales to make it the right size to fit into those sorts of spaces. And give you an alternative on that as well. Yeah, yeah, great. We, we've, we've done exactly that quite a lot. Speak louder. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> an alternative 
I'm, I'm presuming you're meaning where your straw bale wall comes up and you've got your sloping uh, roof coming down, you get that triangular shape under there at the top. How you plug that, That's and we found, we have done exactly using bale needles, we've made up triangular pieces and put them in. But if anything, we found that probably to be the place that we've had the most difficulty sealing. So what we've done in our building since, because um, different to a lot of the straw works buildings, we, ours are very much timber frame and the straw bale is just infill, we've com built our straw bale wall, compressed it, and then in the top we've put a, um, a timber, like a lintel, right the way across the top, and then stud work from the top of that lintel up to the wall plate. Mm -hmm. So, and then we fill that in with sheep's wool rather than straw, so the rest of it's straw. Mm -hmm. that bit, because the, you're pressing the rest of the straw bale down, and you're using the stud work to brace between the wall plate and, and the bales, you, you don't get any, any settlement or movement in that, those small wedges yeah, you put in. Yeah, that's a good but idea. There's many yeah, different ways. Lots methods. of different ways, yeah. yeah. And if you would have to give someone free advice as to if they have to build a straw bale house, what would you say? Like for building themselves? For building themselves. Come on, one of our courses, go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> make sure your straw bales are really, really compressed. You want them um, the size, as I said to you, but weighing between 16 and 25 kilo. You want them really, really tight. Um, mm. And um, have a lot of fun. Go help somebody. I don't yeah, and go and help somebody. Great build, idea. Build a veranda. Is a <laughs> build yeah, a veranda. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, go and help somebody as a volunteer. Good idea. So I think we just, because there's lots of hands up, I think we just wave our way back across the room. So if we then go to the lady here. Thank you. Um, the current issue of the Chartered Institute of Building Services Engineers magazine, it has an art, which I haven't worked on, has an article about um, <coughs> using straw for insulation. And it talks about um, the architects having designed wooden panels with straw mm. infill. Mm. I'd love to know if it's possible to do that to insulate an existing building. I want to convert a garage to um, a, a, a room in, in the garden. This is Bristol University. Yeah, the Bath. The Bath. Bath, that's right. yeah. yeah. Uh, Modcell. A company called Modcell um, have prefab straw bale walls. But, um, but can we learn how to make, make them ourselves? I doubt it because they, they got a huge European grant, about 1.6 million, to learn how to make do it themselves. So I guess they're not going to pass that on. But what they have got is a production. You know, a place where you can buy the walls. Okay. You can buy the straw bale walls. And there's about four other prefab country co companies in Europe, too. Yeah, it's really coming prefab straw. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is more, well, for Tedro and um, Ben, um, because I found it really interesting to uh, see your two presentations, which to me seem animated by the same vision and passion but um, definitely two different paradigms to me. The passive mm. house is very much starting from uh, an idea and trying to make the materials fit it, whereas Ben starting from the materials and trying to uh, develop a kind of vernacular architecture around that. And my question was, what do you have to say to each other? How could you work together? <laughs> you see, um, I, I, I certainly can see many possible overlaps. I mean, the, I think, whereas I'm, I'm working very much with the sourcing of the material, and for me, the key thing is looking after the woodlands. Okay, so I'm, you know, my focus is actually helping woodlands, mm. and the byproduct of that <coughs> is making buildings. Um, but the, the, the way I'm looking at it is, yeah, how, how locally sourced, how sustainably sourced can I find those materials? It doesn't flow, answer the question, the passive house answers a lot more, which is, you know, what is the long-term energy usage of the buildings I'm building? Whereas passive house might be um, using a lot sort of more energy at the beginning in the building process, but over the lifetime of the building, it's obviously, you know, the figures start to stack up in its favor. So my, my answer would be, well, take the principles that we're doing with sourcing the materials and looking after the woodlands, but apply the, apply the passive house principle to that. Now, I don't think you're gonna meet the sort of top levels of passive house with the type of materials I use, but I think there's a halfway meeting place. Mm. I, I actually yeah. clearly agree. I mean, I think passive house, if 
with those who are passive house experts in this room, there's a lot of permaculture in passive house. It's about the potential of your local environment. I will add is, is that passive house loves craftsmen. We love good builders because they are not building buildings to be thrown away in 30 years. These, these are supposed to be long-term century to two century long buildings. So, you know, yeah, I don't think your buildings probably would get to as low an energy footprint, but they sure are beautiful, I'll buy one. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And I think the key issue as well is the whole idea of retrofit as well, that we have so many buildings that need redesigning now, and we can't just all live in a new, <laughs> yeah. beautiful building. Sorry. I mean, I've, I've always had so much horror of outside buildings, but when I think of them, the, the, how do you get rid of the condensation of water inside without losing heat? Right, so that's, that's actually passive house strength. So when we open windows, right? We can't control where vapor flow goes, right? And so the Germans were very, very smart in developing a very light mechanical system that is very good at extracting moisture, okay, but then replenishing when you need it. So it's actually a whole ecosystem way of having moisture balance through the entire building. Because, yeah. That, that, that's right. It, it, there's all these different systems. And, you know, people might say, well, you know, mechanical systems, do we, do we want them? But, you know, frankly, once you start getting into larger projects, like multi-story buildings or multi-family units, because the nice thing about Passive House, if they've gotten up to a project in the United States where it's a uh, building for 300 families, you know, all of a sudden you have to look at mechanical systems. You, you, just, you just have to. Yeah, but the energy is so low, it actually proves to be lower than opening windows. So there's these weird phenomena in passive house because they're so well insulated. The weird thing is it's less expensive to run the energy continuously than to turn it off, cycle it off. The, because of the fact that the buildings take so long to cool off and heat up that, or, you know, that, that all of a sudden there's these backwards ways of dealing with building mechanicals. But it, it works, yeah. Another way of abs absorbing, absorbing moisture could be, I mean, not talking about passive house here, but in straw bale house. Inside, we usually use, use clay plaster, and clay is a great thing to absorb water. But that's, to me, that's different, because it's more natural. Completely different. It, it is different, it's, but it's another solution, if you like. Yeah. So we're, we're getting away from tapes. What, so sticky tapes? Well, yeah, yeah. We're not doing that any longer. That's no longer. No, no, that, that's, uh, so, uh, yeah, so uh, look at, we're all concerned about the interior environment of our buildings. So the United States, we're finding that interior toxicity is 10 times greater than outside. Now this is before <laughs> Passive House. But due to mold issues, due to too many glues in the interior, all these things are a concern, great concern. And I'm not worried about off gassing, but the long term air tight is the where you get into detail, you've got to seal them. Right. And then you do your air tight and test it. How do you now? So, so now, now we use something called a liquid applied membrane that seals inside every crevice. And it's actually certified by those who know the living building challenge, which perhaps in terms of trying to create a completely holistic approach to building, it's certified by them. 
And you, you just spray it on and roll it on. It's liquid. It's like it's like paint. Yeah. How is it called? The stuff we use it's it's Prosecco Argard. Um, yeah, that's that's the name of it. It's just a liquid. You just roll it on, and it's it's sort of a rubberized membrane, and it, it just fills in every little crevice or hole. You're only doing it on the exterior, right? So you're doing it on the exterior sheathing of the building, so it's not gonna it's not gonna penetrate into the interior. Um, everything's to the exterior. Um, would you mind writing the name of that? Well, that's, a, that's the very question I asked you not to ask me, because so I, <laughs> <don't know. laughs> I don't know the answer. Um, but I do know that we've had tests done. If you have a look on our website, I think there's stuff on there. It's strawworks.com, uh, .co.uk, um, about the passive house in, I think, Lincolnshire. I think it's there. Um, but there were tests done on that, yeah, for air tightening. There's it, it, a little this video. More of a curiosity question. Um, John Cole lifetime ago, we had it very efficient houses, we've got Keller, very efficient houses, mm -hmm. we've got Cobb houses, with the Ento Evans, pretty efficient as well. Um, how far have you moved in North America? Because Michael Reynolds got his ass kicked severely with building code regulations. I think this one that obviously passive houses that people do top end but on that continuum of permaculture materials, how much more acceptable are building regulations and building codes in America now than they were, say, 10 years ago? Yeah, so about five years ago, you would hear talks given like how to build a lead house without, with, and stay out of jail. <laughs> right? I mean, there was a real backlash from the building code community. It shifted a lot, um, and you know part part of part of the reason is uh, there's been a lot of work done inside these building industry communities to try to say, look at folks, you know we have to create more energy efficient structures, we we have to do it, and so yes, the the government's starting to align with that. Personally, I think the next big battle is how to deal with human waste on site, right? right? Because again, it takes a lot of energy to process human waste, it takes a lot of water. So that's sort of the battle we're at now. It isn't so much around the building codes, at least in my area, right. you know, but it is, it is around dealing with human newer. Maybe it's true. I, I know somebody who lives in the Midwest in a straw bale house down to minus 40. Mm. And when you look at the figures for that, it, it's pretty phenomenal. I think we get too obsessed with absolute efficiency. And there's a continuum along the line Uh, so in America, we use a program called BOPT, right. which it's free, and it does a pretty good job of finding that balance point. Right. It's just in America, we're finding these passive houses, the construction cost almost, it's about 1% higher, okay? And yet you're saving vast amounts of money on energy. No, no concrete, no. They always say that a straw bale house has good boots, a good jacket, and a good hat. So um, <laughs> the, uh, the, they're never, the straw bales are never on the ground. They're always, there's always a foundation. We often use either car tires or self-draining foundation where you dig down and fill with rubble, a bit like Ben was talking about, really, without the uh, slab on the top. Um, and we would perhaps have a, um, have a dry stone wall, little little wall, uh, about 50 centimeters. And then on top of that, you would put your, we call the ring beam on the bottom and then build the straw. And for the, so that's the good boots. The, uh, the good hat is you'd have an overhang of about half a meter all the way around. And a good jacket is you'd have a good line. Good plaster. Uh, plaster, yeah, three coats of line. Yeah. We, we do sim similar except for um, basically our straw bales 
uh, all of our buildings have a raised floor. So we have, we have air circulation below, a lot of insulation in the floor, and then we put on the bail ladder similar to the, your, your ring, and then the bales go on there so they're raised sort of 50 mil off the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's also where we run all our services now in the service duct under the lump, in, in the front of that behind the skirt. Thank you. So just a question for um, I'm uh, like you, more interested in care of my 30 acre woodland than what I do with it. You mentioned European larch, mine's Japanese larch. Is there any problem with that? Any use for alder? Any use for wild cherry? Yeah. And if I compass anything, I don't get bluebells, I get brandy. <laughs> <laughs> um, Japanese larch is, is perfectly usable in construction, it's not as strong as European larch. Um, there was a very good project done about 15 years ago, the European Union project in Great Britain, Finland, um, France and Holland, where they actually tested um, about six or seven species of roundwood for construction. And the work done in the UK was done at Surrey University at Guildford. And um, out of all of the timbers they tested in bending and compression, European larch came out the strongest. Um, Japanese larch is structurally not as strong as European larch, but it's perfectly usable for the type of building we're doing. Alder, your best bet really is charcoal, firewood, um, possibly a bit of internal furniture. You can get some nice colours from it. Cherry is certainly into furniture making. It's beautiful wood. It makes, uh, makes lovely tables, chairs, that type of thing. Um, it won't coppice, it suckers. So no, it right. sends up shoots from the, from the roots rather than the stem. Um, you're getting brambles, sorry to hear that. Um, <laughs> it's quite common, you will often get brambles, especially when a woodland hasn't been coppiced for a long period of time. But if you allow the coppice to reach a closed canopy, the brambles will retreat. That I'm, I've discovered. Um, I've been told by the forester from the wild forest that it works if you use pigs because the bluebells go straight to the pig and out the other end and you will actually get bluebell wood. Before I had pigs <laughs> rampaging over anything, I just wondered if you had any experience with it. I, I would not recommend using pigs in an, in an environment where there's bluebells. Um, from what I've seen, is um, it tends to destroy a lot of the bluebells. They'll also, if they're in confined in a small area, they will destroy some of the coppice stools as, as well. I mean, the problem with keeping pigs in woodland, it's a, it's a great idea in the right scenario, but too many pigs within an area of woodland and you're just gonna end up with a mud heap and everything destroyed. Um, can be done as long as you get your stocking rates right. Where they're best used is often where you've had a plantation woodland and you're looking to disturb the soil in order to then get natural regeneration coming back. I have a question of my own for the panel. I guess I think it would be good for everybody to comment on, but it's going back to this issue of retrofit um, and the relevance of, I mean, I think we all agree on the absolute beauty of vernacular architecture and the importance of the idea of building to suit materials. But when you're stuck with a building like many of our buildings are, particularly in Australia, that are just horribly designed, and <laughs> you know, I mean, are you best off scrapping it in terms of life cycle? What's the applicability of vernacular architecture and that kind of approach to retrofit? Well, <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm in Ukraine and the vernacular architecture is bad Soviet Russian block housing. <laughs> it's beautiful for retrofit. Yeah. Who cares what you do? Yeah. But in our projects, <laughs> you know, we, uh, we have found it's the exterior insulation that is absolutely vital, right? So, I mean, it, it, the interior is good, but it's, it's really getting massive amounts of insulation on the exterior is where you find those dramatic drops of energy and, and air sealing. And retrofits are brutally hard, mm. really, really hard. In some cases, you just can't do it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, my, my experience is, I'm afraid, a bit more brutal than that. Um, we, have, we did um, put up a building on, on a site where there was an existing um, concrete building. Um, basically, we demolished it, we brought in a concrete crusher, we crushed the concrete and then used that as the foundations to then build the next building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So recycling the materials, if, you, you know, if there's no way of doing a good retrofit from what you've got. And the difficulty is, I think, with any integrating natural building into 
any buildings where there's already concrete is you're always going to have a problem of moisture mm. being trapped behind the concrete. Mm. So it, it becomes very difficult to balance the two. Um, that's why we avoid concrete in you know, inside all our buildings. I think that would be the same for us. You know, you could wrap a straw bale skin around a building. Yeah, uh, it would be fine. But like Ben says, if you can't, you know, if you've got concrete on the inside and so on, you've got moisture problems. Yeah, tricky. Yeah, exactly. uh, sorry, I think there might be moisture problems if you could wrap a building in straw bales. But I think, like Ben says, if you're wrapping a concrete building, you're going to encounter moisture moisture problems. And there aren't ways to get around that with some of the maybe I don't know. Anyway. I don't know enough. Um, you could certainly you could certainly knock out areas of concrete and put in lime to create breathable channels within mm. it, but it's still not <laughs> ideal. Mm. Okay. How long do you, do you wait between the different plasters? You said you applied four different plasters. Three, three coats, three coats of lime on the outside and three of clay on the inside. How much time is between the different plasters? And do you do you uh, like spray water on it? Yeah, it depends where you are. For example, when we were in Bulgaria doing ours, the, um, it was about 38 degrees. So the problem was with the lime going up too quickly. Yeah, so we did have to keep spraying down and we had to sort of work behind wet sheets, you know, to make sure nice. that sort of thing. Um, but if you're in a colder climate, then of course it's going to take longer to go up. So it's a bit, bit the same for the clay, really. It depends on the environment. Okay, so we're almost out of time. We'll just take one more question because we've got a hand. Uh, it, it just from what I asked and then what I've been listening to, which is what I call breathable buildings, it sounds like the straw bale and the, the wood-based building are quite breathable, mm -hmm. but if you want a sealed building, do you want breathable walls or not? No, because breathable walls, they, 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 you actually lose a lot of energy, and you're actually introducing a lot of water, a lot of va water vapor, into that wall assembly. So you're getting away from what I call an organic building into something that's yeah much yeah. more box like. Um, yeah, not you box know, like, but you know, much more. Sealed. It's it's yeah, very sealed. very sealed. That's yeah. right. Okay. You know, because because remember, vapor water vapor is trying to drive. It's always trying to go either from the interior to the exterior, or the reverse, depending on your climate of where you are. So you're actually bringing a lot of water into your wall assembly. With with uh, vapor drive, but it feels like almost like, like a, a polar thing here between organic, breathable buildings and sealed ones. We have we sort of discussed that very much. Except that we we have two examples there on my presentation of two passive houses mm. with mm. straw bale walls, mm. and yeah, they reach the standard. Breathable. Exactly, so they reach the yeah. standard. So. And you know, as you know, my background's not the right, <laughs> I haven't got the right physics and all the rest of it, so I don't know how that works. But, but apparently they were fine. So there may be a nice mesh between the two and the, you know, the way we were talking before. Thank you. Yeah. Can we thank all our panelists for a great session?